So this would draw them down certainly below that. That's number one. Number two, I'm trying to figure out why, why and I sat through that presentation too and I kept saying to myself, so what is the consequence if we don't spend the money? The consequence is, look, for decades, Village, you know, we had an outage recently, and yes, it's an inconvenience. Yes, it's not very long because our crews are great. Is it worth this money to have this ability to um, eliminate a few hours of downtime in the whole village? Is that really worth all this money? And the high, to me, these supersized poles. So why are we do, you know, why, why should we do this? Well, First of all, Laura, you, I think, are probably the only person that is upset about the polls. And frankly, uh, given that it's a personal issue for you, I, I like higher polls rather than lower because I don't see the line so much. Secondly, to me, this seems like it's coming into the idea of redundancy, which natural systems have. And I don't think it, my sense is from listening to this, it's not just about the power outages, it's being able to, if something bad happened or, and bad things are always gonna be happening, it gives us more flexibility. And that I think is critical. Well, it's a, it's a huge amount of money um, to have a little bit more reliability. And yes, if the, if the whole east side got taken out, maybe well, if it was taken out with like a, a, a wind event, uh, it wouldn't matter that this was improved because you ha wouldn't have the lines to serve those people anyway. So it's really, Go ahead. well, it's really coming down to trying to reach, which is a noble goal, 100% on all the time every day. But, you know, these are like, modern problems. I mean, we have pretty great electric service, even with the few hours a year that people are out. So I think this is a good discussion. Uh, it definitely hits on some policy things. You know, the other aspect of this is we've been sitting on this money since I've been on council, and it sounds like well before that with when Laura was manager and before that, um, I feel strongly that we should invest it. I, I question Laura, your characterization that this, this amount of money would just be this minuscule improvement. But at the end of the day, we haven't gotten the grant yet. This is next year. So when we get the grant, then we can start talking about if we're going to, you know, move forward with, you know, what we approved as an obligation and, and have some of these other discussions. Um, Did so. we, pa we passed a resolution to apply for this grant. Yes. We, yes, I don't know if it was a resolution, but we did we pass a resolution. Uh, I don't. I mean, we 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 said move forward. I don't know if it was a resolution. Well, this is what I mean. We never really have discussions like this, which we need to have before we apply for these grants, because there obviously can be a small commitment or a huge commitment. So I think we and we all agreed with that. So we'll make sure it's it's a resolution and super formal moving forward. And discussion. Here's where Right. Can, can I just get clarification? If there is no match required from the village, if it's a straight out m monetary grant with no match, do you still want a resolution? I do. I think, and I think it's actually required. It isn't always, and that's why I asked that question. I, I, I would, I think council should always approve a grant. Just like if somebody gives us a gift, we shouldn't just take it. We should always pass a resolution accepting the gift. And part of the reason for that is gifts come with their own co other costs sometimes and, all, and other obligations, as we're about to find out with the country commons easement issue at the BCA at Township on Thursday. So, Yeah, we show it because we're taking on obligations when we apply for grants and we uh, accept gifts. Those should be resolutions and discussion, meaningful discussion. <clears throat> hey, Brian, just so you know, the, we did pass a resolution because it had to be submitted with the 
grant, so we we did pass that resolution. Yeah, thanks for confirming that, Johnny. I mean, honestly, I think we we always have a process and discuss it. Um, so, but yeah, I think we can move on. Okay. Um, let's see the alley. That was uh, the one that I showed you earlier that was shared with the streets. Uh, pole change outs again. We a lot of hundred thousand dollars for pole change outs a year. We've been doing that ongoing, uh, and it's made significant improvements. Um, these were in there before LED street lights. That is just uh, money in there that we allot each year. That way we're not doing a major change out at one time. So that will buy a skid of LED lights and then the staff themselves put them up as the other ones uh, go out. Uh, and cutouts is an ongoing thing. Uh, we spend $4,000 a year putting in new cutouts and getting rid of the porcelain. Uh, Key Sally. Hey, Johnny. Yes. Kevin here, sorry. Yep. Um, I mean, I know we have, I'm 112% <laughs> behind LED streetlights. Um, but do we, are we able to easily say uh, what we're saving uh, by switching from wherever we're doing now to LED uh, in, a, in a manner, to, in, a, in an effort to sort of balance out our expense? I, I can check into that, Kevin. The ones that we have in now are called induction lighting that we put in in 2012, uh, the village did. And they literally had a five year warranty with them and they lasted about five years in one day. Um, and the LED is just a little bit better as far as uh, usage wise, but lifetime is like 10 or 15 years longer than the five year induction lights that was bought. Uh, but I will try to get you some of those numbers. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thanks. We'll, we'll put up the spec sheet, Brian, um, to compare the the features of those uh lighting systems purchased in 2012 versus the led that we're purchasing now so and and the cost of the leds have come down significant since mm -hmm. 2012. right right mm -hmm. so Great. i think i think overall certainly those lights are are better performing uh than those in 2012 and a lot oh, of yeah. Is. yeah um going to water um uh, Replacing broken valves as we do the hydrant flushing, as we do the unidirectional, uh, we have valves that are breaking on us. So we're allowing ourselves $25,000. Uh, we just replaced the one at um, High at West South College, as you guys probably see with the gravel there. Um, we're lucky that that one lasts as long as it did, just to be honest with you. It was actually half open or half closed, whichever you want to say. Um, and so they should see a little bit better pressure in that neighborhood. Um, replacing the fire hydrants, uh, my staff is going to try to tackle the majority of that this year. These are, the hydrants are about uh, $4,200 a piece. So we have a couple already in stock, so we're going to try to uh, replace some more this year. Um, Let's drop down. These here are projected out here just to keep them in the radar. We still need to look for grants for them. Uh, we, you know, I'd love to have brand new remote water meters, but until we can find a grant to help us out with that additional cost, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, new mower for the water plant. That is for Brad out there. Brad actually took one of the old John Deere's that was bought in probably 2005 and the motor locked up right at the end of the season. He was not able to finish. He had to actually come borrow some of the other mowers to make it happen. This mower would be just for the water plant stored out there and then they mow their own grass to help out the parking wrecks. That way Tanner and his crew can concentrate on all the other mowing. With it split up like that, then the guys are able to do some other work. The new uh, well, we are waiting on the uh, new well monitoring. We actually are waiting on the EPA to come back 
and let us know whether we can drill where we thought we needed to drill for the monitoring wells or if they think it should go to a different location. Um, so we are waiting on guidance from the EPA on that. Donnie, um, yes. is, this, is this the well that would, for example, detect uh, pollution from Morris Bean or yeah. is it what we've talked yeah. about that would be closer to Vernet? No, these are the three that would be close to Morris Bean. Mm -hmm. The one that's over by uh, the Vernet site, uh, EPA was going to look into that one as well. The Ohio EPA was going to look into that one, Mary Ann. They think that uh, the part that went up into the Vernet's property was an old glacier, so they did not feel that it was a necessity to have a monitoring wall there, but they was going to look into it and get back with us. Hey, Johnny. Yes. A total random thought. Is there any way that you could direct CARES Act dollars to the remote read readers so that your readers, meter folks don't have to enter homes? Is there any way to finagle that? It, it is an allowable use of the CARES Act funds. The challenge we saw when we were speaking about it is that it requires such an expense. And, um, you know, I, we brought the project list to council. And so it was on the project list, but it's such a such an expensive items on the water meters. But it is uh, <laughs> uh, it is it is an expensive endeavor. And related to that, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, Josue also um, you know went after capital budget dollars, and we know that the capital budget didn't happen in June. There is going to be a mini capital budget um, in lame duck. Um, <laughs> I know that we're also thinking about trying to get county dollars for this. Yes, we we uh we're putting out a request. Uh, thank you, Brian, for reminding reminding me that Brian and I, uh, early in the year, we uh we met with Perales's office and we were able to get a couple of our projects on uh, the endorsement list for the capital appropriations budget. And you know, then COVID happened, but. We, this is one of the projects that we were able to make a case for, and there was interest from the legislators uh, for this project because they understood the value of it. So we'll continue that effort. The, um, Marianne, this is the one that I was talking to you earlier about that I can maybe have Sway put up some information. The new water truck, um, this truck that we were replacing has 77,358.3 miles on it. It is a 2005, uh, it is a diesel on top of that. Um, and it scores like a 29.6 um, system. Uh, I think it's 29.6. This is what it comes out. Uh, I'm sorry, the pictures are sideways, but this is information that we put into the iWorks. A brand new vehicle is a zero. And when they get above, a, I think it's above a 20, they, they recommend that you start changing them out. So this is entered in. Uh, it is a E350. It's for the big water truck. It hauls our trailer. Uh, they rate it as a poor and uh, normal use. Uh, this is the truck that we're talking about replacing. I can tell you that since I've been here, we have, I'll get you a more accurate number, but I'm gonna bet you that we've got a better part of $15,000 keeping this one running. Um, the batteries alone was like $1,300 to replace because they are underneath this box. You have to drop them from the bottom and it took her worth over a week to get the batteries out. Um, the floor and the inside is uh, rotten, so we actually have a painted mark there to keep the guys from tripping on it. This is upside down. This is one of the fenders. And there's the other side of the fender. Um, so how do I stop sharing that one there? Uh, switch tabs. So um, that is the one that we're actually wanting to replace. The meter vans was the one worse than this one, and we replaced them uh, last year. So 
this is the one that is scheduled for this year. After this one, I don't know of one in the fleet that is projected to be replaced anytime soon. Um, but I can get you all the other information, uh, Marianne, on this particular vehicle. What would happen to that vehicle then? The vehicle would actually not be repurposed. It would be listed on GovDo. Uh, and and who, who is likely to buy it? How much do you think we would get for it? Um, I'm going to say you, you know, based on our old bucket truck, uh, when we put it on gun deals, uh, it went a little bit more than what the traded value is going to be. But I'm going to bet you that we may get about 4500 bucks for this one, maybe, uh, because of the being a diesel. Uh, they're a problematic vehicle from the very beginning, from the first year it was bought. It's been problematic. So we're hoping, I, I would think, 4500 bucks. So are you replacing it with a diesel? We are not. I do. We do not have anything diesel on anything other than our large bucket truck and our small bucket truck and digger truck. They don't come gas option, but um, these are going to be gas vehicles that we're getting. And they do have the, um, the ones that are diesel, they do have that Deftron fluid to where it repurposes and burns the exhaust. So they're a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, one that this would be replacing would not be a diesel truck. Diesels are good if you're going long distance or you got to pull major stuff. Uh, there's no reason why we should have diesels for everyday vehicles in the village. I mean, we even had a diesel lawnmower a couple of years ago. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Well, uh, at the time when fuel prices and were high. And the time of fuel prices is high, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, it was not a good choice, though. Um, engineering for the water towers. Uh, if you recall, we put in a large amount of money last year uh, as a placeholder. We actually did some uh, talking with some people, brought in some consultants. They did some testing and then they was talking about taking over the water towers and they brought us back a proposal and they wanted $176,000 for the next seven years and then $68,000 for the remaining. And then they would do the maintenance, they'd run the towers, they'd paint them. And that cost got you nothing more than just painting basically because the towers run themselves. So that was way over what we had anticipated. So what we'd like to do is, is we'd like to go uh, put an RFP out for an engineer to come in, draw up the specs, uh, draw up the RFP or the request for proposals, be able to send it out so we know exactly what we're looking at per tower, and then also have somebody manage them as far as an engineer for the testing because they got to know what paint's going on them. They got to know what condition the towers are in. And that is beyond mine and Brad's capability. You know, we know paint is paint and they know what the actual codes are. So if you can make them look pretty, that's one thing, but if they last is another. So we have put a placeholder in there for $25,000 to get that ball rolling so we know what we have at the end of the year, so we can come back to council about the next uh, next steps. So the line item there says engineering for water tower paint specification 450,000. Does that mean that we are spending 450,000 just for the engineering for the paint specification? No, I didn't change that one. Sorry, Marion. That we had had two hundred fifty thousand for a couple of years on there. That's what two twenty five. So I just changed it. Hey, uh, Josue, did we hit record on this meeting? Uh, I did uh, into the meeting. So I'm sorry I missed the first. Uh, I think we missed the first uh, about first hour of the meeting. Okay, I was just thinking since Laura had to jump off, um, and then. Johnny, I just want to clarify, maybe you said it and I missed it. Um, 
this is just exterior painting or because we've already done this this is both this, this is, is both interior and exterior uh we actually had them scored so the the southernmost tower is the one that's going to fail it's it's within two years of being out of its lifespan of the paint the north tower is within three years of being out of its paint life expectancy so they scored a little bit better than what Brad and I had thought they was going to score. So that gives us a little bit more time to be able to uh, get an engineer in here to be able to project what it's going to cost when it needs to happen. The other thing it does, Brian, is, is when they did the um, assessment, I would say, of the towers, they brought up some major safety issues, which I was unaware of. And we have now changed protocol. So when the guys go up there to change that light on the top of the tower, there's no safety, there's no click on, they just walk up top of the tower. So that is now officially, if that light burns out, it burns out. Because I can't have staff going up there without this proper safety stuff. So we need to bring the towers up to uh, safety standards. So when the guys do go up the towers that they are safe at it. Um, I can share, I can get some of the pictures and share with you guys uh, through email of what the towers look like inside and outside and some of the problematic areas. But I really think engineering is the way to go on it. Uh, so we can see what we're looking at versus having an ongoing maintenance contract that got us nothing. You're on mute, Lisa. There you go. Um, I do agree that it's not just about looking pretty. Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, mention that Johnny and I uh, earlier in the year started having conversations about, you know, a decorative um, paint job on the water towers when they do have to be painted. So um, that's still something that I would be interested in talking about, knowing that what really matters is that the paint quality is safe and all that. And, and Lisa, on your point, uh, so if you guys have been through Xenia, you'll know that they painted their towers, but then they let their towers set for a year and a half before they actually put anything on top of them, said Xenia or anything like that. And that is per the recommendation of the painting uh, factories that nothing goes on that app until it's completely cured and it takes over a year for it to cure before you can put murals or anything like that on there. So um, on the sewer capital, um, ongoing camera work uh, is on there. Um, we're gonna have uh, Insight come back in and do some more cameraing. Uh, the, Shared services here we've already talked about. Um, raising manholes, we got some that we're going to raise again. That's ongoing cost. Lift station pump. Um, that's uh, two years out. I'm sorry. Uh, relining a sewer. So after we do some camera work, we're going to assess to see which ones need to be uh, sewer relined. We actually got the first little bit of server relining since I've been here and since probably ever uh, done this year, which was a great improvement for uh, the village and moving forward to uh, kind of completed a little bit of the CMON study that was done years ago. 2012. Uh, 2012 that sit on a shelf. I heard uh, RCAP told me when you print it out and you sit it on a shelf, you'll never touch it again. So what we want to do is we want to make it a living document. Uh, so we have put it on a shared drive and we have the staff that is actually being proactive uh, to get things done and, and bring it up to speed. Uh, we've done a lot of manhole replacement on the lids, uh, getting some of the holes closed up, putting in solid lids. We've done a lot of the uh, clean out caps that needed to be done. It was actually bought by the way in 2012 and they were still packaged up. They were just sitting in the barn. So we didn't have to buy them. We just had to unpackage them after eight years. 
So uh, <laughs> we got that taken care of. So we got them at a cheap deal eight years ago. So we put them in 2020. 2012 and put them in 2020. Right. So. Hey, Johnny. Yes. Um, sewer relining, uh, it's, it's, this might be a little bit off topic, but you know, when, when there's, uh, you know, homey discussions of the senior center, you know, there was talk about the need for, I believe doing relining, uh, you know, along Herman, is that something that, or is that piece of it, something that'll have to happen eventually, whether that senior project happens or not? Kevin, we put that on one of the high priorities and it's already been taken care of. Cool. Herman Street is done from Xenia Avenue all the way to Corey Street. Now that's not, it's not solid. It's what scored the worst got replaced already with the new sewer line. That's what went through the uh, Antioch farm. Uh, it was some of the worst underneath the animals right there. Uh, so we got that taken care of. We also got the section up where the, uh, in front of Herman or in front of uh, Friends Care has been taken care of as well. Is, is that part of what was happening on the farm? Yeah. Like three weeks ago? Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. So, and, and by the way, I think it is uh, Home Inc. had actually, um, if they do put that facility in there, they have actually obligated their self to paying some of that money back as well uh, for that added cost. Great, thanks. So, and, and it may be appropriate for us to talk about the sewer strategy here. I know we've uh, we we brought this up in the past. What's been our approach to how do we identify areas um, to do the cameraing and then do the relining? Uh, Johnny and the team and I we looked at the map and we said, all right, what do we know about our systems? What are the oldest lines and where do we think conditions are? Where do we have issues? So on the map we identify those areas that we know are trouble areas and that we know are the oldest and just Correct. from a back in the envelope calculation, what, uh, what's gonna need uh, repaired and uh, or replacement improvements. So the next, the next version of the camera work is hitting on that next phase, all right? What do we know what the next trouble areas are? So to Johnny's point, we looked at the trouble areas, we got those done because, and I'm glad we did because some of those we're at risk of collapsing. And if they collapse, you lose, it would cost so much more money and you lose control over the work because you're just forced to have to deal with it right, right. then and there. So um, I think we're looking at a five-year project. Wait, at least five-year project. So five-year project. Um, so this is, and we're budgeting around 100 to 150,000 every year so that we could, uh, get the entire sewer system taken care of over the next five to eight years. There was two areas that they slated to do this year relining, but then they couldn't do it because they figured out that for some reason, and, and I can't, nobody here can explain it, but you go from a six to a four to an eight, uh, or you go from a six to a two to a, a six. So they've got a, a problematic part in the middle. So now we have to go and dig it up and make it a solid pipe. That way they can come back in and reline it the next time. So we got a mismatch. I mean. Yes, the mismatch system. Yes. So um, going, keeping on with sewer, sludge press hopefully will be here next week. The sludge getting out of the wastewater treatment plant has been a challenge on itself. Uh, and we are scheduled to have the sludge press on site either the 11th or 12th now. It was supposed to be this week, but they pushed it back another week. Um, and then the SCADA system. Can I take this one? Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> He's excited. <laughs> Our wastewater treatment facility was upgraded to the finest technology uh, in 2012. 2012. 2012, finest technology. It operates on this computer system, the SCADA system. That system was not updated. It, it is an old computer system and that is the brains of the operation. And it was not updated. So we've got a faulty computer system is throwing off sensors. 
think previously we had reported on these uh, false alarms we were getting at the wastewater treatment facility. We did, we upgraded the network. Yep. We ran new, uh, new CAT6 wiring. We updated sensors and the, because these things were just going off in the middle of the night. So somebody had to go check on a wastewater facility driving up overtime cost. And one of the sources of the problem now is that computer system, the SCADA. So everything got upgraded except the computer system. So we need to, we need to update the, the SCADA system is running on old uh, Windows XP. It's not supported. It's just not supported by Microsoft. It's just, yeah. So that's what we needed. We need <laughs> That's like antique. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard Windows XP for years. Yeah, but if you leave Windows XP alone, it'll keep running. See? Hey, I've got some rotary phones that you guys can <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, so um, that is my uh, capital budget or my team's capital budget for 2021. Um, I just want to, I just want to say this. I think it's important to say that I do take the money very seriously. I do take uh, public works very seriously. I also take the providing the best service to the village of Yellow Springs as my job, as my, uh, my responsibility. And I would not buy, I would not apply, I would not go for any grant if I would not spend it out of my own pocketbook. I'm not buying vehicles. I'm not buying uh, new swing sets. I'm not repainting the pool just to spend the village of Yellow Springs money. I take this job seriously and probably take it more to heart than probably anybody in public works, but that's my job. But my team is also the same way. Um, I want it to be the best place possible to live and work. And I want us to be the people that they're like, well, y'all spring to know, why can't we do it? And it's been a struggle. It's been a challenge, but I welcome a challenge. I, would, I don't like to struggle, but uh, I just thought it was, I needed to say that because I feel some of the times that we are questioned on some of the decisions that we're doing. And trust me, if I didn't have to spend the money to spend, to get things correct, or for the safety of the manpower, or for the safety of the village, we would not spend a dime for this money. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Johnny, and I want to thank you and your team. And you know, I've been thinking since our conversation a few minutes ago about electrical outage, how important that is. I mean, it's easy to say it's no problem to have your power out for a couple of hours, but if you're home on a ventilator or on some kind of a breathing assist. That, you know, that's easy to say, and, and we need to keep our community safe, and that includes having our utilities um, where they need to be. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, so I, so I, I, I would like, okay, Kevin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butt in here, <laughs> and then I'll back out. <clears throat> I, um, I think as a council person, it, our role here in sort of looking at staff's proposal it is critical. And I certainly hope that when it seems like we push back or something that it doesn't seem like we're not having confidence in staff. But I think that uh, in, in finances that it's important to have this kind of checks and balances. And so for me, the more I can understand about something for example, the fact that we've had these studies done on the electric system and on the sewer system this year is very helpful. So for when you come, when it's for the loop electric thing or the sewer relining, I can go, oh, okay, we've had presentations about this. I understand why this is important. So the more I think council can understand things, and we've been having good conversations about this uh, today, I think, then the easier it is for us to be come from an educated point of view. But while I can understand why there could be some tension, I certainly hope staff uh, understands that we appreciate what you have been doing and are 
and are also trying to do our job too. Echo, I echo all of that, and I, I, I treat. I'll, I'll make a blanket blanket statement um, that I see all of this as an in the, an investment, you know, in our future. It's not just an expenditure, you know, to get over the hump, uh, the hump du jour, as it were. Um, but, but, you know, we're all going to be better off when we have better systems, not running Windows XP anymore, uh, and, and, et cetera. Um, but I, do, I did have a question that I just want to be clear on in my head about the uh, electrical system. Um, to what degree, in, in, given the potential for the development uh, out here, to what degree are we, are we required to add some additional capacity in order to serve that, that area in the future? We don't need that. We, we, we don't need the added as of this point. So we can actually add right about 325 homes without adding another piece of power to our, our system. Uh, so this development, say this development would take uh, a third of it, Kevin. The other thing that we also got to understand is, is on a normal basis, we're only pulling maybe five megawatts, but our peak is somewhere around 11 or something like that. So you have to plan wire size for the peak because right. you could have an uh, outage in the middle of the hottest day of the summer so that therefore you got to plan that outage. So we do, we still have some, uh, I was a 3.5, I believe, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, 3.5 megawatts left without getting more power from Dayton Power and Light. Problem is, is we need to know what it's going to take to get more power or to have them bring us more power so we know how to plan for the future because they could tell us, Kevin, they could tell us tomorrow that it takes us $20 million to get more power and the village is going to back up and we're going to figure out how many solar farm fields we can put in the village for that amount of uh, money as well. So the study with Dayton Power and Light will be a, a very good starting point to tell us whether we're going to go the Dayton Power and Light way or we're going to start putting up a wind turbine or something ourselves, or trying to figure out how to reduce the electric that is used in the village of Yellow Springs. And that starts with the government. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So Johnny, just a, um, one point related to that 325 homes that we can handle on the grid. Um, I, if that does come up again, let's make sure that we also, I guess, include like how many businesses that would be. Um, you know, because so we're thinking holistically about what the future loads might look like. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Johnny, I really appreciated uh, the clarity on this presentation. And uh, I know that you, like Josue, get really excited about talking about this stuff. And we love to uh, learn all about it. Um, but you did a really good job of managing the time. And, um, and we had time to, you know, dig into some of these things. So great job uh, on that. And then the other thing I want to just highlight because, you know, Marianne and I um, and Judy, you know, obviously preceded us, you know, came on board after a long period of deferred maintenance. I still don't really understand what the prior councils were doing. And so obviously the work that we've been doing to make up for 25 plus years of not doing what should have been done has been super challenging. Um, I appreciate that uh, Johnny and the village team have taken that on, the council, council is taking that on, and that we continue to move forward because it's going to be huge um, in sustaining our village. So thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, really great job. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, have we covered everything? I think we covered it all. So our next step for us is to uh, um, fine tune it, make those updates like on the, on the total project cost and whatnot. We'll, create, we'll uh, take pictures and provide some of that background information that you requested. Uh, so we'll work on this over the next uh, couple of weeks and have 
the package ready uh, for the December 7th meeting. Now this, uh, the budget gets approved on an emergency basis, so it could go to December 21 um, as well. We can schedule two, uh, two discussions, two agenda items uh, for this budget. So any thoughts on, on that? Well, one thing it does remind me of is, um, and I, I think we were supposed to talk about it at agenda planning uh, last night, was uh, Laura had mentioned that we should try to have a public hearing or public meeting about the budget. Um, I think that's a good idea as well. Um, so question, I think that. Question on that, Brian. Um, I, see, I see these work sessions as public meetings, right? We, we invited the public. Mm -hmm. The public has joined. I don't know who's joining, who's joined today or you're able to I see the list. Uh, but I know that we did have citizens uh, in the last two meetings in the, Yellow Springs. Uh, in the Yellow Springs News. So help me figure out what if there's anything to do on my end in terms of public public meetings. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think one thing with these work sessions is you know the timing doesn't necessarily lend itself to people you know, participating. Um, I don't know, Let, let's, um, I, does anyone have any thoughts about this idea of a, a public meeting that's obviously streamed down and focused, but gives people a chance to learn and comment? Yes, I think, I, I it's think a it good, would be a good, go ahead, Marianne. Okay, yeah, I, I think having two sessions to go over the budget, at, at least uh, during regular council time, is important. I think, Josue, when you have done the, what do you call them, the pie chart things, okay. um, that that's very helpful for people to understand where uh, the money is going. And I think that, uh, uh, what do you call it, a bird's eye view sort of, in terms of looking at our, uh, the things that we're gonna be doing this year some of the, whether it's the electric work or the sewer work, um, the parks work, pulling out some of the major things, whether it's major in terms of expense or major in terms of impact, um, pulling out some things and, and talking about them as well as having the pie chart things that show where we're spending money uh, would be helpful during a regular council time okay great i will do that um, i i agree um you know and i recall that when we were talking about the budget for policing we you know had some questions about um about that still not about like cruisers and stuff but about personnel and i mean brian what would you think about about having a conversation with the justice um group just around the policing budget just pull that part out and talk about it with that stakeholder group yeah that was my thought about the um, meeting uh next tuesday is that we would focus on that um and that was kind of my you know signal last night that uh whatever kind of data and, and discussion around you know main activities for our officers um and anything else would be good so yeah i think i think that um that that is what i'd like to do on tuesday i do have a concern about that i i i think there's a step that needs to happen before that and i think that that step is that the chief needs to make at least one presentation that breaks down how the officers or how the department is spending its time uh, because it's not just the officers it's the dispatch I, I it, it may be more difficult to do than like when we get a report on the electric system or the sewer system it, it probably is more difficult but i think that the YSPD needs to do some upfront work saying, this is our vision, this is how we're moving toward it, and this is how we are spending our time. And, and I think that people need to then come in and respond to that. Otherwise, I'm not, I'm not sure that having citizens 
Well, at any rate, I'm putting that out there because I think it's important for us to know what we're talking about before we start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. And that's, that's actually the, the structure of the conversation that I had in mind is that that would be led by Chief and Sergeant Watson if, if she's going to join as well. And Florence and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, Do you gosh, want to two things I were going to say, and uh, maybe it's too early for me. I don't know. I forgot one of them. But I think what I, one thing I wanted to say was in terms of, you know, having the budget discussions publicly, um, you know, it's, it, you, we could sort of consider that as a compromise or a hybrid form of participatory budgeting. I know it's not the same, but in terms of uh, informing the public or giving them an opportunity to, to witness, you know, the nit noy things, you know, that, that, that quite honestly could appear, uh, you know, boring and mundane, you know, but, but, but it would certainly give the public an appreciation for the le level of effort and time, you know, that goes into, you know, going over these things, you know, line by line, line. And I think it's, I think it's real important. Uh, another thing I'll say is um, here on camp, well, I'm at home, but on campus um, for each uh, shift of public safety, we get, uh, you know, a, a safety activity report that details what folks are doing for that eight hour shift or however long their shift is. Um, and I wondered if, if uh, the police do something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm talking, you know, I, I went to this building, I sat here for 20 minutes, I checked all the doors, the building was empty, you know, those kind of things. Uh, are, do the police generate those kind of things during these shifts? Yes, we do. We have a daily log and um, daily log varies. We have daily logs for several different operations. Dispatch has a daily log on when calls come in, what unit is, is the deployed, dispatch, um, what are the findings? So if there's uh, an item that's open, a closure. Then we have the activity report by the individual police officers, what, um, what they do on a, on, during their shifts. Uh, a lot of that information is being entered in different, in different areas. One of the things that I've tasked the chief with is logging every, every encounter. So, and generating some of these encounters, meaning, you know, not necessarily stopping people, but engaging folks. If they're in downtown, then checking in with folks or checking in with businesses um, as part of their patrols. So they do generate the, a daily log um, on several operations. Um, Florence has her, has her uh, monthly, she has her own daily log of what uh, activity she's engaging on, what cases she's working on. And then she generates the, uh, the monthly report which is the community outreach uh, specialist report. And I think you've seen that in your council package, what referrals were done, what services were provided, what food uh, was distributed and all those things. So we do have those reports. And uh, I've had a conversation with the team from the uh, first meeting that we had, which was around uh, the police department making, telling the story. What is it that they're doing? How they're spending the time? So the approach we were taking and organizing that work was to ident uh, itemize and outline every program as a service and how are the police officers assigned to every services? Because I think that's part of the storytelling that's, that's missing. Um, Chief st has started that conversation in a, in a and the presentation he made to council several months ago, where he itemized all the different programs that we have. We have the school engagement, we have the chaplain's program, um, bike patrol, um, the, uh, we've got the, the, I'm blanking on the name, but it's um, where we follow a domestic violence case through the entire contingent of care. So, if we get a call for a domestic violence where there's a child involved, um, we follow up with the school, we follow up with their other resources to make sure that the child is being properly served through the continuum of care. Uh, so there's things like that that are happening behind the scenes and there are particular individuals that are assigned to that work. And so the police officers is not just sitting in a car watching, looking out for somebody to run a stop sign. 
if we did that in town, <laughs> you know, there would be plenty of work um, for that, but that's not all that they're doing. They're also assigned to particular program activities. And that's a story that we're hoping to tell um, next time around. Well, and can I say you have this synchrony, I don't know if it's accidental or not, but village goals are coming up to be looked at again at the next meeting. At the same time, you're doing your budget and um, the more overlap there is, I think the more sense that makes as a citizen that those are not disparate documents, that those, uh, those have interplay. So if there's a goal that's listed in the, around the justice system, which is something like support our police department in becoming community centered. And that may mean purchasing different kinds of uniforms, you know, uh, making money available for certain sorts of programs. Then I, as a citizen, can see that council is supporting that police are moving in that direction, that there's not a disconnect between council saying we want a better justice system and the police department saying we need $34,000. So I think that everyone can kind of play a part in bringing those narratives together, goals, mm -hmm. police department, all, all those things. It's, it's good timing. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. You raised some good points, Judy. And Josue, with regard to that report that police uh, chief gave us, that was in a retreat that he actually presented that. And it's been in the packet maybe once, but it's never been presented publicly, as it were. I mean, I know our retreats are pu public officially, uh, you know, but no one has really seen that report besides us for the most part. Right. And so I think it might be uh, good for Chief to, uh, you know, maybe refine that a bit and uh, and do and then present that in a in a typical uh, council meeting. It, it and we, we could do that. And I would love as he would have, would love to have more time to be able to do a thorough presentation. I think a lot of our reports um, before council get anywhere between 10 to 20 minutes. Mm. And I think that kind of conversation requires maybe a, a bit more time. Understood. Okay, so, you know, one, you know, one, you know, chunk of time, you know, will be that JSCC meeting. And then I like the idea of, you know, bringing forward, um, you know, maybe a higher level piece to a council meeting. Um, I think the other thing we haven't really resolved is if there is going to be this other public meeting. Um, and I think I, we don't need to figure that out right away, but we need to soon. Um, I don't know, it's still kind of resonating with me that outside of a council meeting, maybe even attached to a town hall, some kind of presentation that, you know, highlights some of the big areas, um, gets people thinking sort of what they're getting for their tax dollars and, um, and then setting up some discussions that we'll have at council meetings. Uh, but anyway, uh, unless someone's got like the perfect idea right now, let's keep that out there and, and think about potentially doing something like that. I like that idea. I, I, I think it'll be good for us to do like a town hall type of presentation. We've already got the structure in place. We already have an audience in place. Um, so we could, we could use that platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be good to advertise that then ahead of time mm -hmm. in the paper and on our website. Yeah. So, so okay. thank you, everybody. Thanks for all the work that went into this. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to see everyone. It's, su yeah. it's such a difficult day today, I think. I mean, yeah. I'm experiencing uh, it, it, a lot of anxiety. It is. There's a lot of anxiety today. And, you know, I think, um, I mentioned, as I mentioned yesterday, we're, our team is, um, is on, on duty all day. We're, we're, uh, we're actually going to be working uh, well into the night. Just uh, one of our contingency plans is um, if a winner is declared tonight, that there may be folks that want to express their emotions uh, in a public space such as downtown. And so we are prepared for that scenario as well. So, so I will be, I will probably take the, the afternoon off because I want to be available at nighttime and I have a 7 p.m. meeting, library commission meeting. 
And so I'll be back on the clock at seven and I'll probably be uh, on through uh, until midnight in, in case a winner is declared and there's a public expression. Thank you. All right, well stay safe. I'll yeah. entertain a motion to adjourn. Hello. Okay. Second. All right. Second. Think we got all those. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Take care. All right. Have a thank good you. Day. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to take a look at the chat first before you stop recording, just in case. Oh, all right. Okay. Close it. <laughs> End the meeting. <laughs>